Now this round of travel from Kanyakumari to the foothills of Himalayas is essentially for the rivers because uh, India's rivers are uh, depleting, <coughs> have, are becoming seasonal. As you know, you're close to Krishna. Krishna is almost gone. The water in Krishna is from Godavari. It's not real Krishna. Narmada has become seasonal. Kaveri has become seasonal. To a point where the scientific projections show that in another fifteen to twenty years, literally sixty percent of the rivers in the country will become seasonal. So essentially, why this is happening is, so there are two types of rivers in the country or in the world. One is uh, glacier-fed rivers, the others are forest-fed rivers. In our country, only four percent of the water is glacier-fed, rest is all forest-fed. Forest-fed essentially means when precipitation happens, when rain happens, because of the root system and the bioactivity that is there, the water that comes down will sink into the earth, is held there through the aquifers. It's a complex system how the river water comes. But we have removed forests and uh, tree cover in a big way. So whenever it rains, now we have either flood or drought, flood or drought. The cycle of flood, flood and drought <coughs> is happening all over the country as you almost every day see in the newspapers. Somewhere in one place there is flood, in another place there is a drought. So this is going towards a very serious uh, situation where by 2030, it is estimated we will have only fifty percent of the water that we need for the population. I wanted to just imagine the civil strife that it will cause. And already in many places, average distance in many villages that people are walking to get uh, water is about four and a half kilometers. So this distance is going to increase. As the distance increases, uh, civil tensions will also increase. And if cities are well provided for, it's not far away when millions of uh, rural people will just come and camp in the cities and it will lead to total chaos. So this is not alarmist activist talk, this is proper science, it's definitely going there. Everybody knows this is happening. We also know what's the solution, but uh, nobody to tie it together. So I thought it's time to take it in our hands and see how to put it together. When uh, I was at Puducherry, the chief minister there, uh, Sri Narayan Swami, said, uh, Sadhguru, twenty-five years ago when I was in Rajiv Gandhi's cabinet, we had a very similar policy plan which was prepared by the experts in the government and we wanted to pass it. But we could never get concurrence from the states. We tried very hard, but states would never agree for anything. So this has been the biggest hurdle that because rivers are a concurrent subject between center and state, the states never came together as one voice. So they could never pa pass any policy. All the river policies that we have till now are only about how to share the water, not about how to keep the river going and flowing twelve months in the year. This time fortunately, all the states, literally all the states, the chief ministers are participating in the events, all the governments are totally with us and most of the governments are sa signing MOUs as to how to implement it in their states. All this happening in a very effortless way, only two chief ministers I met to convince them what the policy is about. The rest of them I just wrote a letter, within fifteen days all of them confirmed their dates. So this is concurrence, one of the biggest <coughs> One of the biggest hurdles we had towards a river policy just happened effortlessly. Now the next challenge is, if we aggressively implement this policy, it is a complex policy of nearly seven hundred page document which we will be presenting to the central government or the prime minister and then to all the states and all the environmentalists and universities. Across the world we are giving out these copies so that if anybody has contributions to make, we will give three to four months' time to do that. But uh, if you make a policy like this, aggressive implementation will take ten to fifteen years' time. After the implementation happens, it will take another five to ten years before actually you can see river waters coming up. So we are talking about 
a policy which will take… which has a gestation period of twenty to twenty-five years. This means four to five governments would have come and gone. Many of us may not be here in twenty-five years' time. Such a long-term policy for government, a democratically elected government has to pass means. People of the nation have to clearly say that we have matured, we are a responsible generation. If you do something for the future of this nation, for the future of the future generations of this nation, we will stand with you. This is why the missed call campaign that we are doing, we want forty percent of the electorate to vote for it so that the government can pass it because this policy involves very large financial outlays and there are many complexities of execution. Execution is not going to be simple. Fortunately, twenty-five percent of the land is still in the government hands. That we will make it into forest for sure, I have no doubt about that. But the remaining seventy-five percent is in the farmer's hands. Of this eight… Uh, six to eight percent is delta lands. We can leave the delta lands as they are. So sixty-five percent of the land, approximately fourteen thousand kilometer run of the river, which means twenty-eight thousand square kilometers, we want to turn it into plantations of fruits and other tree-based agriculture. Fundamentally shifting <coughs> the riparian farmers from crop-based agriculture to tree-based agriculture. With this, the farmer's income can be raised anywhere between three to eight times over. Only thing is, it will take four years minimum before he sees the income. In seven years' times, three to eight times over, he can increase his income. But those three to four years, he needs support. This is where the government's uh, involvement becomes very key. And another aspect of this is, see, there are only two aspects to a river. Augmenting the river flow, another thing is managing the usage. When we say managing the usage, eighty-four percent of river water is used for agriculture right now. We are still irrigating the lands as we did a thousand years ago. Many nations in this world are growing similar crops that we are growing, getting much better yields but using ten to twenty percent of the water that we are using, simply because they have brought in technologies. We had a few uh, Vietnamese experts with us, they stayed here for four days and we were discussing many things. They said shifting from paddy to fruit cultivation in their country, farmers' income has gone up twenty times over, two thousand percent. We were amazed how, how does it happen twenty times. They are laughing at us. They are saying, twenty years ago we came to India, studied in Indian universities. We took this knowledge and implemented it, you got PhD. <laughs> so, there is a huge knowledge base, but there is no agency because in India everything is operating in silos. There is a university, there are academics, there are scientists and the farmer is another world by himself. We want to set up agencies which will bring this knowledge to the land so that these things if we don't do now, we can't be going on doing things that we did a thousand years ago. Even now if you go in many parts of the country, we are still plowing with a wooden plow, okay? We think it's romantic. It, there's nothing romantic about it, it's just that it is before Iron Age. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> I'm talking before Iron Age we were plowing with wooden plows. We are still plowing with wooden plows. Nobody gave that farmer a better plow. I'm saying we've just left them like this. Sixty-five percent of the population is involved in farming. They are the people, today we are all sitting here and talking because somebody is us. The food doesn't come from the supermarket, the food comes from the land. This magic of turning soil or mud into food is not a small thing. You try to grow a crop and see what will happen to you. You may be very well educated but you can't do it. It needs a certain intrinsic knowledge as to how to do this. <coughs> so the person who does this magic for us of turning mud into fo food, we have treated them so badly that in the last ten to twelve years over three lakh farmers have committed suicide. Whenever this farmer suicides happen, the explanations that you will see in the media is that because the tomato prices dropped, he committed suicide. Because of some bank loan, he committed suicide. Believe me, if you and me get into farming, on a land… on a land which is not fertile, and there is not adequate water, it will drive us to suicide. 
exactly because it's a heartbreaking activity to do that. Today, the soil in India is depleting in such a way, it is estimated in next forty years, sixty percent of India will be uncultivable. The rally for rivers is uh, about coming up with a comprehensive policy which is enforceable and implementable. So this needs the concurrence of state and center. Fortunately, the states have concurred. Center will definitely go with it because we have already consulted them on this. So uh, the people also have to stand up and make their stand clear that long-term policy means all of us will have to go through some pain. That we are willing to go through this little pain for the future well-being of this nation is the statement that you are making when you do this missed call. Entire Telangana, all of you the stars must make sure entire Telangana and Andhra Pradesh should make the call. Yes. And uh, anyway, I have to say this, both Telangana and Andhra Pradesh governments are doing a fabulous job with water. No other state in the country is doing what is being done here. It's very progressive, very wonderful to see that they're doing it. It's the right thing to do. This… Uh, or this mission Kakatiya or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. the lakes and ponds and also the Harita… Harita 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 This is the way to do it in a tropical country. What we've been doing in the past is all transplanted from Europe or North America. We must understand European nations receive nearly 225 days of rain in a year. But we have only forty to forty-five days rain and it's a tropical country where temperatures are at least fifteen degrees higher than what is there. So we cannot transplant those policies, we cannot transplant those methodologies. Tropical country has to handle this way. Right now what's being done in these two states is the best thing that can be done. There are other scientific aspects to it. I… we… Uh, we are looking forward to work with the governments to see how we can introduce other dimensions to it, but this is definitely the right direction what they're taking. Any question? Thank you, Satru. I think I, you've uh, created such a large awareness uh, and much needed of the art right now. Once the director, uh, no names to be taken, he told me, Charan, I'm making a movie in, in the future. It's a war-based movie, a couple of years back, and he said it's the the concept of the war is a fight for water. I thought he was a mad guy, <laughs> that he had no other better cause for a war apart from, and not usually it's land and everything. Now I realize uh, what a foresight he had that this is happening actually. Drinking out of plastic bottles, we think we are all fine sitting at home. How has been the response to it? It's been the fourteenth day. I said only two chief ministers I had to meet to convince. Rest Others I just wrote a letter and they respond. On a larger scale, we understood uh, planting uh, horticulture on either side of the river. See, the important thing is the land should be in shade. If organic… see, to call soil as soil, According to the UN standards, there must be a minimum of two percent organic content. But in states like Punjab, Haryana, Maratwada, southern Tamil Nadu, some parts of Andhra Pradesh, the soil… organic content in the soil has become 0.05 percent, not 0.5, 0.05 percent. This means this soil will turn into sand in the next three to five years' time. We are making soil into sand by taking away all the organic content. The only way you can add organic content to the soil is the leaves of the trees and the animal waste. The trees are gone lo long ago and animals are all traveling overseas. See, if you cut an animal and eat, that's not the problem. The problem is when millions of animals are going away, what is going away is not meat, what is going away is topsoil. India has an average of fifteen inches of topsoil. And every year we are taking out 5.3 billion tons of topsoil, which is little more than a millimeter. So just make a simple arithmetic and tell me, how many years is it before we are a total desert? People estimate in about 250 years, India will be a total desert if we go the same way. 
This is not rocket science. Every farmer knew if I have ten acres of land, how many animals I should have, how many trees I should have, is something that's always known to the farmer. But today, we have uh, very too much of textbook science and very little sense, unfortunately. We have a lot of budget allotted for uh, irrigation or uh, other departments which is concerned to this rally. You think our governments are not reacting as fast or they're not reacting at all? Or as I said, what? these two states, they're doing a wonderful job. The amount of greening that's happening in these two states is phenomenal. Nowhere else is it happening. We have done a lot in Tamil Nadu, but as an organization, not as a government, we have planted over thirty-two million trees in the last uh, fourteen, fifteen years' time. But that is a private effort. If the government was there, we could have made this into thirty-two crores probably. Now uh, they are saying uh, in Telangana they have a plan to plant uh, some two hundred and ninety crore trees or saplings. Well, that's a way to go. Now we have an MOU with uh, Maharashtra where we are planting fifty crore trees in the next four years. We have an MOU with uh, Karnataka where they are planting twenty-five crore trees along Kaveri banks in the upper uh, riparian area. This is the way to go. It is not like one NGO plants uh, ten thousand trees and they are very happy, somebody plants uh, one lakh trees and they are very happy. This is not the way to go. It has to become an administrative process. It has to become governmental. Individual <coughs> people, organizations doing is nominal. It is not really a solution. I have a question. Okay, so um, my question, it's actually two questions. So everyone thinks that organic food is only for the rich. Mm -hmm. So can you please tell us uh, some ab thing about that? And also, um, how do we make farming cool? I mean, I don't think farming is cool. No. So how do we make farming cool if we want more people to do more agriculture? See, uh, whatever ideas they have in urban areas, I must tell you, even today, it is only the poorest of the poor who eats organic food. <laughs> because uh, in the villages, that's how it is, they're growing vegetables around their house, that's purely organic, nobody is fertilizing them. So, the problem that's happened is this. In the last forty years' time, we have moved or we have tried to move from subsistence farming to commercial farming. Subsistence farming means somebody had three acres of land, he grew everything that is necessary for his family on the land, he ate that and he was healthy and well because he, he grew multiple crops. But today he is growing sugarcane, let's say. Now he is getting cash, but cash is not turning into nutrition. Cash is not transforming itself into nutrition. Today if you see in the south, the main staple diet is just this, rice, tamarind, chili, onion, you have the meal. We know how to make tasty magic out of just tamarind, chili and uh, <laughs> stuff. If you go north, it's wheat, the rest is same, no tamarind, but chili, onion, it just happens. So, one thing that you see in the village is today, in these better off states, I'm talking about southern states which are considered to be better off states, if you go into a village, you will see at least forty to fifty percent of the people, their skeletal system has not grown to full size. People think that's how the villagers are. That is not how a villager is supposed to be. A man who works so hard on the land, he is supposed to be built well because he never ate properly all his life. Right from his childhood, he never got to eat properly. All of you make this much effort, okay? Only two percent of country's population can even think of sitting in a comfort like this. So at least keep your eyes open because this is the only way your humanity will be on. Please <coughs> just watch. In Hyderabad city, things may be a little better, but if you drive around in the villages and things, just look at a human being, first of all, have they grown to their full size? You will see sixty percent have not grown to their full size. 
if body is not growing to their full size, obviously their brains are also not growing to full size. Yes? We are producing substandard humanity. Underdeveloped humanity we are producing. We are going on talking about, uh, you know, the demo demographic dividend. You just go and see the quality of human beings we are producing, nutritional level. Apart from that, there is education, there is skill and many other things. But fundamentally, your body and brain has grown to full size, then we can get you to do so many things. If these two things don't happen at an early age, then you're finished, your life is closed. There is nothing you can do, isn't it? Do what you want, I put you in the best school. What is the point, I'm asking? Your body and your brain did not grow to full size. After that, what? Life is closed, isn't it? Like this, we have closed life for nearly forty to fifty percent of our population. That's the tragedy it's quietly happening in this country. See, nowadays health is being extended. As all of us know, caste has been the bane of Indian society. It's been doing a lot of harm. Still, health is being extended on the basis of caste. Can we stop that? <coughs> Say, you are not uh, entirely wrong about it, definitely caste system has caused a lot of disparity and lot of pain and suffering. But at the same time, we must understand why this caste system came into uh, existence, first of all. When there were no schools, when there were no universities, when there were no technical <coughs> institutions, the only way human beings got their skill was from their parents and the elders in the family. For this, suppose your father is a blacksmith. <coughs> we insisted that you must marry a blacksmith's girl because if you marry a goldsmith's girl, she will not know how to support you. She will not know what kind of food to give you. She will not know how… To, what kind of coal you need, what kind of firewood you need, what kind of implements you need around you. So we insisted, if you… if you are in the… a certain profession, you marry only from that profession. You are in an agricultural ma uh, uh, family. Now you don't go and bring a princess for yourself, it's not going to work for you. So they insisted it has to be managed because this was the only way knowledge could be transferred from generation to generation because there was no organized way of doing it. So communities stayed together and they evolved their own ways of cooking, their own ways of doing things because as it is suitable for their profession and their way of life. It was a beautiful system but the problem came when the goldsmith suddenly started thinking that he is superior to the blacksmith. So what is a difference, a wonderful difference? We are a, such a colorful culture, we are on the same street. Today it may be gone in Hyderabad, but if you see in a village or a small town, on the same street people are living. People have been living there for thousand years. But the way this house cooks and the way the next house cooks is different, okay? Because their caste will decide how their food will smell and taste and everything. Because of this, we develop such a colorful, fantastic culture. But when we turn differences into discrimination, what is a difference if you make it into a discriminatory process, then exploitation starts, then ugliness comes in. So unfortunately, <coughs> that happened over a period of time. But now we have come to a place, you could be born in any family, you can become an engineer or a doctor or something else or something else. So slowly it will become irrelevant. But the only reason why caste system is still holding on is, we still don't have a social security system. So if you stay within your community, you are supported. If you suddenly go out of your community, you have no social security, you are all on yourself. So that is one of the main reasons why rural societies stick with their own community because suppose your life goes wrong, Suppose accident happened, suppose you got injured, suppose you got sick, suppose your husband or wife, somebody died, who is there for you, I'm asking? Because there is no social security. The only way you have social security is sticking to your community. So this has been maintained like this, the discriminatory aspect of what is happening must be removed. This is what the governments have been trying to do ham-handedly, but the effort 
of all these reservations <laughs> and other things is to take away the discrimination. But I don't think we should take away the differences. It's, it's nice that the differences are there. That's why we are all different, that's what makes us colorful and nice. For all of us who are same, it will be too monotonous, isn't it? <laughs> if I walk into your home, not just in India, anywhere, I am not somebody who ever inquires what is that cash because it not, doesn't even occur to me. But the moment I sell, I smell the seasoning, I know this is a Pillai home, this is a Gounder <laughs> home, this is a Naidu home, I just know it because the moment I smell the food, I know. <laughs> and it's nice. <laughs> but uh, Isha Foundation, uh, Foundation is doing really wonderful things. But finally, whatever MOUs we are making it, is it going to be legislated by the government of India or how? Otherwise tomorrow because of no. the politics. No, the MOUs are jumping the gun. MOUs are jumping the policy gun, okay? Before the policy comes, these are initiatives which have been taken by the state governments, which is wonderful. MOU has nothing to do with the policy. When the policy happens, it will be mandatory <laughs> and implementable. So, to what extent can we make it mandatory is a questionable thing because it has to be handled gently. Suppose farmers go, some rabble-rousers will come, some politician will come and say, they're trying to take your land, they're telling you what to do, let's protest and immediately they'll burn the buses tomorrow. These things can happen in any moment. So what we are going to… what, what we are going to do the next thing is, in Maharashtra already the work is on. We want to set up large-scale modules. We've already done small modules. We want to set up large-scale modules. Let us say fifty kilometer stretch of a river or hundred kilometer stretch of a river, we will do a project which involves the farmers shifting from crop-based agriculture to tree-based agriculture. In four to five years' time, if we show everybody that economically this is far better the farmer becomes much richer by doing this, after that you can't stop it. Anyway, it will happen. So this is what has happened in other countries. This is what is beginning to happen in Andhra Pradesh because right now the government is wanting to move fifty percent of the land in the state into horticulture. But you need other things like you need cold storages, you need uh, value addition industry, so we are with the uh, CII and uh, your mother is on, on that. And uh, I also spoke to the CII council, they are very much into it. Only thing is the government has to again compensate this. We want the industry to invest first and then the farmer will in invest. Right now what's happening is the poor farmer will invest, he will grow the tree and suppose his fruits rot in the market, he will chop down the tree or hang from the tree. This is what is happening. First, industry must invest and ensure that the farmer will get the price that he deserves and all the volume of produce that he makes will be taken. I am telling you in the entire country, if you drive from Hyderabad to Vijayawada, you see maximum number of cold storages, private cold storages. Nowhere else in the country there is a facility like this. This is really fantastic. This is what needs to happen. Private agencies, private industry and business has to get into this. If they have to get into this, they need loans which have a larger gest gestation period, okay? If you get into business, maybe in six months you must start paying back. But if you get into agro-based industry, supportive industry for agriculture, you must give them eight to ten years gestation period to pay back. Only then this will work. This can be easily done, you're not giving away the money, you're only giving them a, a little holiday to pay back. So all these things are various aspects of the policy. The policy is essentially an economic policy with a significant ecological impact because if all the stakeholders don't benefit, it cannot succeed. First stakeholder is the river. River must benefit. River must flow twelve months of the year, that is the intent. And then the life in the river. When I say life in the river, Indian rivers have the maximum number of species in fresh water compared to any continent. Indian subcontinent has the highest number of uh, species of life, particularly fish. There are over thousand varieties of fish in the Indian rivers. 
all of you must be enjoying Godavari Krishna, but Krishna fish is gone, all right? We do not know is exactly how many are gone in the last twenty-five years, but scientists estimate anywhere between fifteen to twenty percent of the fish species may be gone for good, because perennial rivers when they become seasonal, that part of the river, a certain species were there, they are completely gone. So, but there are no studies to tell us exactly what. So, the life that lives in the river, that's the second stakeholder. The third is the farmer. The fourth is the larger community, all of us who live in cities. And the fifth is the governments and the administrations because they must… their income and their revenue should go up too. Only when all the stakeholders benefit, any policy will be successful. Unfortunately, we have not been looking at it this way. When we talk ecology, we always talk against somebody. This must go. So, in any place, whether it's marketplace or marriage, unless both the parties benefit, it will not sustain, isn't it? It's a simple principle. So, everybody has to benefit, only then it will sustain. So, it's essentially an economic policy with significant ecological impact. Can you take one question? Can you tell us this is away from uh, the reverse topic. You know. uh, everybody talks of either attaining spirituality or taking the path of spirituality. I've always struggled to understand the actual path, what it actually really means, you know. and what is your personal path in terms of your gateway to attain what way you are right now in your life. Right now, I'm, the, I'm on the way to Mumbai. <laughs> <laughs> Spirituality or spiritual process is not about looking up or looking down. It is about turning inward. Inward means, were you born like this? That's a tough Same question. shape and size, I'm asking. No, it's evolution. Yeah. No, no, no. Hmm? Evolution happened long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we were not born as monkeys and evolved into human beings. That didn't happen, all right? That happened long time ago. You were born as a little baby and now you've grown up this much. How did this happen? Food that you've eaten, isn't it? So what you call as my body right now is an accumulation, yes? It's an accumulation. Whatever you accumulate can be yours, but can it ever be you, I'm asking. Hmm? Whatever you accumulate can be yours. Can it ever be you? Tell me for sure. Huh? Can it ever be you? It is yours, all right. I'm not disputing that for now. That also will come one day. But <laughs> what you accumulate, can it be you? It can only be yours, isn't it? It belongs to you, but it's not you. So your body is an accumulation, what you call as my mind is an accumulation of impressions. Where the hell are you, I'm asking? So there is no experience of that at all. So you are busy in two heaps, heap of food that you gathered in the form of body and heap of impressions that you gathered in the form of mind. Physiological drama and psychological drama is all that's going on. But is it a fact that you exist? You doubting all this. <laughs> Is it a fact that you exist? So no. You exist, right? Yes. Yes. So now the problem is just this. You know that you exist, but you do not know the nature of your existence. I'm asking you, can you conduct yourself really well through this life if you do not even know the nature of your existence? Hmm? Can you? No. So that's spiritual process. Spiritual process means this. Do you agree with me that this body, this human mechanism is the most sophisticated gadget on the planet? Yes. yes? Have you read the user's manual? <laughs> no. That means you will conduct it by accident. Just many times it happens, you put your phone in your pocket, it calls somebody. That is also a call. I hope it's eight triple nine zero, but <laughs> you can't direct it, it'll call something. But that's how people are living right now. They're being peaceful, joyful, 
whatever is all by accident. Because it's so much by accident, so much fear, so much anxiety about every simple thing. What great things are people doing? Tell me. What every creature is doing, that's all we are doing. We are born, we grow up, we eat, we sleep, we reproduce, we die, isn't it? But this, how much fuss, what an earthworm and a grasshopper and a bird and an animal is able to do without fuss, human beings are doing with great fuss and we claim we are the most intelligent species. It's a disgrace, isn't it? <laughs> So spiritual process means you start reading your user's manual. Tell me, if you buy a phone, would you like to read the user's manual on the first day and figure it out? Or would you like to read it after three years when you're throwing away the phone? When would you like to read it? Yes. But unfortunately, today they have spread this message, you must do spiritual process at the end of your life. Sorry. <laughs> saying by 2030 only half of our needs would be met through the river. So do you see by 2030 you would be tapping the ocean for the rest of our needs? See, you can never do agriculture with ocean water, please. And above all, if you desalinate in a big way, the salinity in the water around the coast will grow up and that is going to cause many, many disasters. Already it's happening in Tamil Nadu big time. I'm sure it should be happening in the coastal Andhra Pradesh also. You have… you don't have much coast in Telangana, is it? No. No, no. no coast. No coast. No coast. No. Oh. No. It is possible that in the next eight to ten years, nearly hundred kilometers inland in Tamil Nadu will be saline water. This means Tamil Nadu will lose nearly 1.2 lakh square kilometers of farmland because saline water is slowly moving up because we keep sucking out the groundwater. We are going 2000 feet and sucking out groundwater. It has to fill up with something. When the ocean is there, naturally the water finds its way. Already it's come 30, 40 kilometers inside. They are expecting it will come to hundred kilometers in the next eight to ten years. This means nearly, probably ten percent of Tamil Nadu will be gone. Saline water, you can't grow a thing. So, desalination is not a solution. That is only for Dubai or those Arab countries where drinking is all they are using it for. They don't grow anything, they import everything. With 1.3 billion people, that's not even a solution. It's okay, in emergencies you can do that. It's not a large-scale solution. Uh, my name is Sai, I'm a land doctor. Uh, my business is because of tobacco. I'm wondering, do you have any suggestions on how can we eliminate tobacco from the life of the world? Because that's the number one cause of human health disease. Uh, you're self-destructive <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, tobacco is the number one cause. People are doing many unhealthy things. Tobacco is just one more of that. I am not saying I am for it. Today we are trying to produce cars without smoke. This machine is not made to smoke, all right? <laughs> Simple sense. But people find some pleasure and stimulation by doing that. A strong cup of coffee can kill you as much as cigarettes can do. You know that. So are we going to remove all these things? Alcohol is being propagated heavily. Alcohol kills more people than tobacco does. But even the activists are drinking, so they won't protest against that. Okay. I am not saying people should smoke. I am only saying these are all many, many issues, many unhealthy things we are doing. But why are we doing these unhealthy things? If you simply sit here, if you… if you just close your eyes and sit here, if you are ecstatic by your own nature, would you want to smoke, drink? 
sorry but would you even want to watch a movie <laughs> not a good thing to say here but i'm saying the need for entertainment and pleasure becomes more and more when there is no joy within you if you're joyful by your own nature you will see you just fine all these things are not needed so instead of helping people how they can become joyful how you this is the greatest chemical factory on the planet isn't it <coughs> only thing is you are a bad ceo <laughs> if you manage this well this will be blissful if it's blissful do i want to mess it with this i am not against tobacco but i never smoke okay because if you are against it you will go towards it if you are simply in a state where you're feeling wonderful right now sitting here why would you want to smoke a drink you look at my eyes and say i'm always stoned <laughs> i never touch the substance but i'm always stoned because this is the best chemical factory on the planet you just have to change the ceo or train the ceo if you come i'll train you <laughs> <laughs>